good morning to you. If you have your Bibles, uh, would you please join me in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to read from verse 14 all the way through verse 1 of chapter 7. I would encourage you and invite you to bring your Bibles uh, every single week in in that we're going to open it up every single week. There will not be a Sunday that goes by that we don't open up the Scriptures. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you, though, we we have provided Bibles for your use in front of you, uh, and and you are more than welcome to uh, use those, if you will. Uh, For those of you who may not know me, uh, my name is Mike Kazarowski. Uh, I have the great privilege of serving here as the lead pastor at FAC. And if we haven't met yet, I, I would invite you to also come up after service and introduce yourself. Uh, I am always eager to uh, meet anybody new who walks through these doors, and it would be a great privilege uh, for me as well, and a blessing to me, actually, if you were to make yourself known. Um, For now, though, let's go ahead and turn to God's Word. Once again, we'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, and uh, we will read from verse 14. This is what Paul writes to the church in Corinth. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore go out from their midst and separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. A brief prayer before we begin. Father, we thank you for the provision that you have given us in Scripture. As we come very weak and very needy, would your Spirit give us assistance and feed us from the rich nourishment of your Word? Would we drink, drink deep from the well of your wisdom and walk in your holiness? We thank you and praise you for the access that you have given us through the redemptive work of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is in your Son's name that we pray all of these things. Amen. If you have traveled on any sort of mass transit or mass transportation uh, during rush hour in the middle of one of the largest uh, cities in the country, you are familiar with the experience, the restricted experience of being cramped. Uh, for space. That feeling that as you stand in the subway or stand on the bus, you sort of need to hold your ground lest you are forced out of the door as new people come in and jockey for position and try and occupy the space that you hold. Uh, That right there is actually the image that we see presented here near the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. As Paul writes to the church in Corinth, that is the position that Paul finds himself in. If you were here with us last week, you'll remember that Paul opened up his heart, his heart to the Corinthians. His heart was wide open to them, meaning that there was space for them, right? There there was nothing between him and the Corinthians as far as Paul was concerned. Concern. There was plenty of space. However, in verses 12 and 13, which we looked at, Paul makes the point that the heart of the Corinthians was restricted or constrained. Their heart was a crowded space. And Paul felt as though he was being pushed out. And it was crowded because they allowed certain false preachers to come in and take up residence and influence them towards a polluted, stained version of the gospel, of the message of Jesus, which is no gospel at all. They would talk about Jesus, but they would also add on to the gospel and make promises that weren't necessarily true. And the the church in Corinth, they were eager to partner in ministry with any messenger or message that seemed attractive 
or glamorous to them, regardless of its validity and regardless of their, whether or not their message was true. And so this left the heart of the Corinthians divided as false teachers occupied a certain amount of space and influence, forcing Paul, who was like a father to them, forcing him slowly out of the picture. And not only was Paul slowly being squeezed out of the picture, but so was the message of reconciliation, the true message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which Paul preached as an ambassador. And so Paul here in 2 Corinthians really is diagnosing the situation as a problem with their heart. And so in the passage that we read today, Paul actually offers the remedy to the situation. There's only one remedy to this particular diagnosis of a crowded heart, and we find the remedy in the first verse that we read, verse 14, where Paul gives them what we would call an imperative. An imperative. It's an authoritative command. He writes, this is the solution to the problem. The remedy is do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. The image of an unequal yoke, it actually comes from agriculture. It's an agricultural metaphor. Uh, And it's one that we can actually find in Scripture. If you were to go to Deuteronomy uh, 22.10, we would actually find a verse that says, you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Now, if you're familiar with farming, the yoke, it's a wooden bar that uh, joins or binds two animals together uh, by, by, by strapping the yoke around their necks. And together they share the burden of plowing the field. And it was very important as a farmer to bind animals, yoke two animals together that were similar in, in size and in strength and in kind. And if you were to bind a big, strong ox with a small, weaker donkey, they would be what we would call unequally yoked. And as you try to plow the field in straight lines, you would quickly find that in being unequally yoked, the ox would overpower the donkey. The, 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 the ox wouldn't be able to go where it needed to go because of the donkey. And instead of plowing straight lines, you would wind up with circles or you would wind up with spirals. When unequally yoked, animals cannot perform the task set before them because they are at odds with one another. So in using this metaphor... Paul commands the Corinthian church, the Corinthian believers, to unbind themselves from somebody, specifically from unbelievers. Now, it's important to note here that the word unbeliever is always used to distinguish those who are outside of God's kingdom, who aren't God's people, uh, to distinguish them from the believer, those that are in the sphere of God's kingdom, who are citizens of heaven. It's those who do not believe that Jesus is the one and only way to reconciliation with God. That is the unbeliever. Now, while this term is generally used for anyone outside of the sphere of God's people, Paul in this context is referring to a specific group of people in a specific situation with a specific problem. Yes, this command has broader connotations and there is a broader application for us, which we'll get to later on. But when the Corinthians originally read this, they knew exactly who Paul was talking about. You see, Paul is not simply warning the Corinthians about the potential danger. He is, but it's more specific that he is instructing them to stop a danger that is already in progress. This command could almost be read, stop yoking yourself. Stop being unequally yoked. There are unbelievers, Paul says, in your very midst who are influencing the church and you need to separate yourselves from their influence. With that 
we see that this imperative in verse 14, to, to not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, with unbelievers, is actually closely related to an imperative that we looked at last week in verse 13, when Paul asks the Corinthians to widen their hearts also as he has widened their hearts to them. As if to say, Corinthians, for you to open up your hearts to Paul, to make room in their hearts, they must separate themselves out from these other influencers who are not from God, regardless of what they say or where they say they come from. And if they don't do that, as long as they are still yoked to the unbeliever, their hearts will remain restricted towards Paul and restricted towards the message that he preaches. Now, what exactly Paul is specifically prohibiting in this command for us as secondary readers, as not the primary readers in the original context, is a little more challenging. We'll try and address that actually when we get down to verse one uh, of, of chapter seven. But before we get there, we find that Paul uses two areas of support for this command not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. And we're gonna walk through these. The, the first area of support is found at the end of verse 14 through the beginning of verse 16, where Paul asks five rhetorical questions which highlight the differences between Christ followers and those who are not Christ followers. And he highlights the relationship between the two and asks the rhetorical question of really, how can these two be related? He highlights that they are actually incompatible with one another. But Paul asks these five questions to drive home the point that, that being unequally yoked isn't just a matter of frustration. It isn't just a matter of, of difficulty or avoiding difficulty in life. No, that by being unequally yoked isn't even compatible. You can't even mix because the believer and the unbeliever are what we would call mutually exclusive, meaning that you can't be both. You cannot be both a believer and an unbeliever at the same time. You are either one or the other. And this is what Paul, basically the point that he makes in these five questions. So let's walk through them together. First, he says, what partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? You see, as, as Christ followers, we talked about this several weeks ago when we were in 2 Corinthians 5. As Christ followers, we are the righteousness of God because of Jesus' work. That's verse 21, right? For our sake, verse 21 of chapter five, for our sake, he, God the Father, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God. We are positionally righteous as believers before God and you cannot be righteous positionally and lawless positionally at the same time. You are either innocent, righteous, or you are guilty, lawlessness. And so Paul asks the question, what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? The expected answer is, it doesn't. It has no partnership. Question number two, or what fellowship, what kind of friendship does light have with darkness? Something in the light is openly visible for all to see. It's exposed. It's, it's, it's revealed in, in believers. As believers, we see the glory of Christ. We see the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's 2 Corinthians 4. Right? We see the image of Christ, who is the image of God, but those in darkness cannot see. They are blind. To the truth. They are in darkness. They have a veil over their eyes. Once again, that's 2 Corinthians 3, right? So, so if they are blind, but we see if there is a veil over their eyes, but our veil has been lifted, what fellowship, what communion does light have with darkness? It doesn't. Light and darkness can't occupy the same space. They cannot share the same space. It's question number two that Paul asks. Question number three, what accord? What accord has Christ with Belial? Paul uses the name Belial here 
to refer to Satan. And you, you may um, find this to be odd because you'll look at this and it wouldn't surprise me if you were unfamiliar with the word or unfamiliar with the name because you actually won't find Satan referred to this name anywhere else in Scripture. We know that it's used, though, as Satan because it was actually used in some ancient Jew- Jewish literature uh, that they would call Satan Belial. And, and it actually finds its roots from a common practice in Judaism where they would refer to Satan or his demons by personifying negative images. Originally, this term Belial wasn't a proper name to reference Satan. It, it actually was a word... Uh, that meant worthlessness or even possibly treacherous, treachery. And so the image personified here uh, using this, this word is that Satan is, is one of treachery, he is, he is one of worthlessness. And so Paul asks, what accord has Christ with this worthless opponent, this one who is a polar opposite of Christ, adamantly against Christ in all he does. Once again, in 2 Corinthians 3, as one who, who, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 4, as one who seeks to blind those. The God of this world, blinding people. What accord. The word for accord here in the original language is actually where we get the word symphony. What harmony, what what beautiful music that comes when musicians in an orchestra are reading from the same score and following the same conductor. It's beautiful. And so Paul, what he is asking is, is what sort of symphony, what sort of harmony is there between Christ and Satan? There is no harmony between the two. Right? It's not a symphony. It's a clash of noise as Satan comes up and is at war with Christ. It's chaos as Satan plays his own tune, his own way. There is no accord between the two. There is no harmony. Question number four, pretty straightforward. What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Think about it in terms like this. If a believer's entire life comes under the influence of the Spirit and under the guidance and leadership of Jesus, and the unbelievers doesn't, if we have a two very different set of values and a different way of looking at the world and different philosophies and different concerns and different priorities, what portion is there? What, what is there to share on any meaningful or significant level? Nothing. Nothing. And finally, question number five, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Now, while the temple of God in the Old Testament, it was a physical location, it was a physical building, it actually represented the presence of of God within the most holy place, the holy of holies in the Old Testament, in the center of the temple, God's presence was manifested. And so what Paul is really asking is, is what agreement is there in the presence of God? What agreement does the presence of God have with the presence of idols? Once again, God's presence and idols cannot occupy the same space. There is only one throne, and it belongs to God. And to bring idols into the temple, into the presence of God, would be to try and replace God's presence with the presence of something else. And it can't happen. What agreement is there? There isn't. You can't have it. These five questions show that there are two opposing camps that have nothing in common because each belongs to a different sphere of identity. They each belong, the believer and the unbeliever, to a different sphere of influence. And so if you are a believer, yoked or bound together with an unbeliever, you you will not only be mismatched with the other, 
but you will never live out what you have been called to do in this life by God. Because as you run the race, as you wholly pursue Christ, as you fix your eyes on Jesus, as you wholly pursue holiness, you will be strapped down by one who will, by their very nature, they will pursue anything that isn't Christ. They'll pursue everything and anything except for Jesus. And so if we as believers, that's our goal, is to pursue Christ, to fix our eyes on Jesus, to, to, to be holy, to embrace his holiness. Any kind of relationship that has that kind of influence will, will, will affect us, will entangle us, will snare us up. And if those five rhetorical questions aren't enough that Paul gets to, if comparing the two different worlds of the believer and the unbeliever aren't enough of a reason to unyoke from an unbeliever, Paul goes on to verse 16 to make an argument based on our very nature as believers. It's in our very nature to be separated out. Why? Why should we not yoke ourselves with unbelievers? Because we, by our very nature, Paul says, are the temple of the living God. What a profound statement. Once again, the temple was a physical place, a physical location uh, uh, under the old covenant. And if you wanted to properly worship God, if you wanted to know and experience his presence and be in his midst, you needed to go to the temple. But the old covenant was a come and see religion. You want wisdom? You want the presence of God? You want to worship him? Come to the temple. And the word used for temple here more specifically speaks about the place of worship, specifically the holy place, the holy of holies, the shrine, if you will. Right? When Jesus came, though, he ushered in a new temple, a new holy place, a new holy of holies. God no longer took up residence in a physical location, but in our hearts. And he is now in our midst. And you'll notice in this passage that the first person plural pronoun, the word we, Corporately, we is matched with the singular noun temple. We together, corporately, are the temple, singular, of God. There are many times where we pray this prayer like, Lord, Holy Spirit, you are, you are welcome here, right? You are, uh, we invite you to be in our midst. And I, I want to, God, would you be present here today, is the prayer. And that's not a great prayer because theologically speaking, he is present. He is here. Now, it's okay to say, Lord, would we sense your presence? Would we know your presence? Would we know that you're here? But he is here. And this is just one of the many reasons why it's so important for believers to gather in person with other believers on Sunday mornings. Because there is something so profound and so mysterious and so glorious when believers come together as the temple of the living God. We, we don't give nearly enough recognition or acclaim to what is actually happening here when we gather on Sunday mornings. There is great value because we are the temple of the living God. Paul goes on to explain that we as the temple of the living God, it's actually a fulfillment of prophecy. This was God's plan all along. And the support for this claim is written all over scripture. And Paul shares some of the scripture to support this. It, it appears that he's actually quoting one source here in verses 16 through 18, but he's actually quoting at least, if not more, six different sources. Six different Old Testament passages. We don't have the time to look at all six individually. We're going to look at them collectively as Paul writes it. However, if you're feeling ambitious and you're curious to study them on your own time, I'll give you the sources. 
Um, In this passage, Paul quotes from Leviticus 26, Ezekiel 37, 2 Samuel 7, Isaiah 52, Ezekiel 20, and Isaiah 43. I'd be happy to give those to you afterwards if you're curious. Each of those texts, however, while separate, they all deal with God's covenantal relationship with Israel. And Paul takes that covenant and those promises to Israel, and he actually reapplies it here to the church as a whole, to the Corinthian church, which is pretty remarkable, actually, and we'll get to that later. This is what the promise was. God promised Israel that there would be a day where he would make his dwelling among them, where he would walk with them. In other words, he would be in their presence, in his presence. And they would experience the fullness of God and the fullness of being his people. And then we come to verse 17, where Paul says, therefore, once again, a word in scripture, when you see therefore, you always have to consider what was written in, it, it, just previous to it in light of the fact that the Israelites had these promises. Therefore, in light of the fact that God will dwell among them and walk among them, in light of the fact that he will be their God and they will be his people, God says, go out from their midst and separate from them and touch no unclean thing on the way out. That specific portion of the prophecy was in in relation to the Israelites' exile in Babylon. It was written uh, by, by the prophet Isaiah. God promised to restore Israel and draw them back from Babylonian exile. And what God is instructing the Israelites to do as they come out of exile, right? He instructs them, leave Babylon behind. Separate yourself from Babylon. And as you're leaving Babylon, don't touch anything that would make you ritually unclean. And, and as they do that, then there is, a, there is a promise of intimacy with God. God is saying, those who are my people, who I, I have called on and elected to be my people, I will bring you out. And, 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 the, and the ones who are truly my people will be holy and they will touch no unclean thing and they will separate themselves out. And those are the ones that, that, that I will be a father to them and they will be sons and daughters to God. The picture that we have here is this sort of binding and unbinding in that order. As the Israelites bind themselves to God, they need to unbind themselves from Babylon. As they bind themselves to the holy, they need to unbind themselves from the unholy. This is what the Israelites were called to do, having been delivered from God from captivity. Now, in using these prophecies, the application to the Corinthians is clear. God's promise to dwell among the people has found its fulfillment in the new covenant community. And just like the Israelites were called to avoid the unclean things that would defile them, that would make them impure, so too should the Corinthians avoid the unclean things that will defile them and make them impure. And herein lies why this command, this imperative, to not be unequally yoked with the unbelievers applies to us as well as we sit in this room. Because like the Corinthians, we too, if you are a believer in Christ, are a new covenant people, a new covenant community, having put our hope and faith and trust in Jesus, believing in him to be our salvation. We too are the temple of the living God with the church in Corinth. There is nothing in this passage said of the Corinthians' character and of their nature that cannot be said of us as well. And so the command does not only apply to the Corinthians, but to us as well. And verse 1 of chapter 7 actually helps provide a little clarity 
for us of what this actually means to be unequal, to not be unequally yoked with the unbeliever as Paul restates the command basically and elaborates on what he means when he says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. He, here he writes, since we have these promises... Once again, we we have the same promises that Israel had since God has promised to dwell among us and walk among us. Since he is our God and we are his people, Paul says, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. It's here in verse one that we see the heart of the command and it has everything to do with our purity as believers, and our purity as a church. You see, this isn't a matter of legalism, of of what I can and can't do. It's a matter of our holiness. Paul doesn't want the church as a whole to be spoiled, to be stained, to be polluted. And with that, we see what this doesn't mean. You see, this doesn't mean that we need to avoid unbelievers at all costs. So some take this command much too literally and mistake separation for isolation. And they, they, they say we are to, to build a Christian bubble and we should only talk to Christians and only do business w- with other Christians and we should only eat at restaurants that are owned by Christians and we should only live in Christian neighborhoods and we should only send our kids to Christian schools. If that's what it means to, be, to, to not be unequally yoked, then this command actually flies in the face of what's written elsewhere in Scripture, especially in 1 Corinthians, where Paul in chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, explains that in order to have no association with the unbeliever, and he gets more specific, he says, with the sexually immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters of the world, you would actually have to remove yourself from the world, meaning that it's actually impossible not to associate on some level with the unbeliever. In fact, living in the world alongside unbelievers is the very method in which God uses to expand his kingdom. Evangelism is not possible if we live on an island only populated by Christians. And so I want you to go out here knowing that there actually is value in our association with the unbelieving world. And we should pursue that and we should chase that down for the cause of God's glory and the cause of expanding his kingdom. That's not what we're saying and that's not what Paul is saying. So when Paul commands us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, he's not talking about having no contact with the unbeliever, but instead he has in mind a particular kind of contact. He's talking about a contact, a connection, a relationship, a yoke that would defile you, that would pollute you, that would draw you away from God's holiness. Paul is concerned with the teaching and the ways of life from unbelievers that stain the purity of God's people. One commentator wrote that at the heart of this calling is the preservation of the Christian community through the cultivation of Christian character and the weeding out of wickedness. Paul's concern is that believers who bear the name of Christ not maintain relationships of shared values that will pollute and eventually destroy the character of God's people. He's not as much concerned about the church's activity out in the world, but rather the world's activity within the church. And so we see this as a matter of influence. Which relationships in your life are your greatest influences and what impact do they have on the direction that you are walking in life? What effect do they have in your pursuit of Christ and your pursuit of holiness? Who is influencing you and how strong is their influence? How strong is the bond to them that you would allow them to influencing you? And what type of influences are we allowing in the church? You see, most have taken this command to primarily mean that you should not marry unbelievers. And while I would say that that is an appropriate and a legitimate application of this command, it means so much more than that. 
to, to, to stick with this idea of romantic relationships by way of example, I would go as far to say that this command means that we shouldn't even be dating an unbeliever. That our closest relationships need to be with that of believers. This command forsakes entering into any sort of partnership that would influence us away from the purity and holiness of God. You see, as believers, our strongest ties in this life, our strongest bonds, our greatest influences need to be with and from other believers. Now, let me draw attention to an obvious elephant in the room. If you are an unbeliever here with us today, I can understand from your perspective that this has been harsh. And I want you to know and I want to reassure you that you are absolutely welcome here. We would love to have you here. We can talk to each other. We can laugh with each other. We can even grab a meal together. In fact, I invite you to have a meal with me sometime. I would love to get out and get to know you better and we can even be friends. But at the same time, we must come to a healthy understanding that we have opposite worldviews that are adamantly at odds with each other, that we live for radically different purposes, that we serve two radically different masters. If we're honest with ourselves, if you're an unbeliever, you live for yourself, and I wouldn't expect you to live anywhere else. I live for Jesus. Yet it would be my hope and desire that you'd be willing to sit down over a cup of coffee with me so that I can get to know you better and understand how you perceive the world. And during that time, if you would be so gracious to let me tell you who Jesus is and why I am so loyal to him, that is a serious invitation to those in the room who may not be so sure about Jesus. Please do not hesitate to reach out. Would you pray? Heavenly Father, we, we thank you, Lord, um, that in your holiness and in your purity, you, you have provided us a way out of our sin and a way out of our bondage uh, to things that you are against and a way out of our death, Lord. And so as we are redeemed people, as we are positionally righteous, Lord, uh, would you make us morally righteous? Would you help us with this? Would you help us unbind, Lord? Because this is a painful process. This is a hard process, Father, as we unbind from things that we used to love more than you. But, but Lord, we come to you as believers declaring that we love you more than anything else, Father, and so would you help us as we bind to you, as we abide in your Son, Jesus. Would you help us release the things that try and take up residency on the throne of our hearts? We thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. And in your holy name we pray. Amen.